Magay, and I will be your moderator for today's panel entitled Emancipating the Philippines from Spanish Colonial History. Uh, we ask uh, you to kindly stand up for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. Margins has blood, sweat, toil, and tears built our country that we may always be sympathetic to the plight of the common man. Grant us a sound mind to discern, with the guidance of your spirit, what is relevant and true using our God-given reason. Give us the diligence in finding our sources, the most exhaustive we can get for any given topic. Protect our sources from destruction and neglect, and preserve our national memory. Provide us with a critical mind in analyzing the sources we may arrive closest to the truth, while recognizing that there can be as many perspectives as it can be. Teach us to be fair to each party, while being faithful to the truth that is in our hearts. Remind us that history, aside from understanding and the complexity and diversity of the present, can also have the power to unite us and the power to make us proud of ourselves so we can build our own identity as a people. Demonstrate to us that our understanding of our own culture enriches our perspective of the past. Help us become a bridge of understanding between the academe and the people and make us learn the lessons of the past so we could create solutions to our present problems towards attaining a better future. Despite the gifts that you have given us, may we stay humble and see our work as a way of serving our students, our readers, our publics. Yet, may we see ourselves as bearers of true enlightenment and justice, not enablers of darkness and ignorance. May the way we tell the stories of our past be relevant to our people, that they may learn something from it. May we pages primarily at the National Quincentennial Committee, Department of Foreign Affairs and other foreign service posts, National Historical Commission of the Philippines, and the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, among others. 
Last week, we had the inaugural session entitled Viewing the Quincentennial, which explored the diplomatic, cultural, and political perspectives that encompass the world's efforts to commemorate the first circumnavigation of the world. Uh, now we are in our more academic uh, session, and uh, this is session two of the Philippine uh, International Quincentennial Conference. And um, after the inaugural session, last, which started last October 20 to 22, we now embark on an assessment of what the last 500 years been for the Filipino. This means a lot of looking back. One of them would be how the Filipino Ilustrado sought to define the ident their identity, educated enough or learned enough to know that they cannot forever be identified as Injo, the Ilustrado would arrogate to themselves the label Filipino, a term which formerly referred to the Spaniards born in the Philippines. This was clearly seen when Isabella de los Reyes titled his work, El Folklore Filipino. To provide context to our discussion on Illustrado historiography would be Dr. Reynaldo Eletto. Dr. Eletto is currently Honorary Professor, School of Culture, History and Languages of the College of Asia and the Pacific, Australian National University, and is a member of the ANU Emeritus Faculty. He was adjunct senior fellow of the S. Rajat Nam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore, and was professor at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at the National University of Singapore. Last but not the least, he is the author of the book, Passion and Revolution, which last 2020 marked the 11th printing of the book, easily a bestseller for the Ateneo University Press. A small trivia, Dr. Leto is a lifetime member of the Philippine Historical Association, which is convener of this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Reynaldo Eleto. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Komagai, for the introduction. Um, I uh, will attempt to read my lecture um, in, and to put uh, my ideas in uh, as simple uh, words as possible, since I am aware that the audience of this uh, conference is a very diverse one and not just comprised of academics. And so while my uh, talk is based on research I have been doing over the past year or two, um, I have uh, skipped much of the academic jargon and uh, will try to speak in, uh, in the layman's terms about the uh, topic of this panel, which is emancipating the Philippines from Spanish colonial history, question mark. Well, um, let me start with some general observations about the commemoration of the uh, Queen Centennial of the coming of Spain to the islands. It's inevitable that we should take another look at what this event was really about. But it's not easy for Filipinos to look back uh, 500 years <laughs> earlier. Um, but I think it is crucial for our development as a nation to be able to reconcile the events of the 16th century with the present. But I will not talk so much about the present. I will talk about the 16th century and the 19th centuries and how they are deeply intertwined. We cannot understand the coming of Spain without understanding what happened uh, in the uh, lead up to the Philippine Revolution. 
Well, I think that judging from what I've been reading online, two of the hottest issues that have been raised in connection with the quincentennial are first, identifying where the first mass was actually celebrated in the islands. And secondly, properly locating Lapu-Lapu, the slayer of uh, Magellan in the pantheon of national heroes. These two events, the celebration of the first mass and the battle of Mactan, represent two conflicting threads in the quincentennial celebration. On one hand, the first mass, wherever it was held, and I'm not going to comment on this uh, ongoing debate, debate. The first mass signifies the century long process of conversion to Christianity that would transform much of the lowland regions into a Roman Catholic nation under the patronage of the Spanish monarchs. The Battle of Mactan, in contrast, has come to represent resistance to colonial rule, whether or not Lapu-Lapu had this in mind, actually. Some people, including the president, I believe, are critical of the idea of commemorating the coming of the Spaniards, because it is said that this only brought misery, destruction, and centuries of colonial enslavement. There is some validity to this view. There were some violent episodes when the Spanish attempted to establish themselves in the islands. Missionaries encountered resistance to the Christian religion they were propagating. Nevertheless, in the course of the 16th century, the majority of the local Datus and Rajas connect together with their followers became subjects of the Spanish king and willingly adopted the new religion. By the way, I must make a note that this is not exactly just a Philippine uh, phenomenon. Uh, all throughout Southeast Asia, foreign religions were being adopted. Uh, some of them at around this period, I'm talking about Islam in, in uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. But there is a problem when we come to dealing with Christianity we go, because we always associate it with something foreign, something Western. But one of the um, underlying uh, themes in my ancient book, Passion Revolution, is that we should not treat the coming of Catholicism, the, uh, you know, the, the internalization of Roman Catholicism. So we, we mustn't treat it as an exception to the Southeast Asian rule. It must be treated in the same way as Hinduization, uh, becoming of Buddhism, Islam, and other religions um, to Southeast Asia happened maybe a bit earlier. Well, anyway, um, it would be a mistake to imagine the establishment of Spanish rule in the Philippines as simply a replay of the bloody conquista in America half a century earlier. In the first place, uh, there were no empires like the Incas and the Aztec to contend with in, uh, in the islands. In Luzon, for example, only in Manila and its environs was there significant armed resistance from the chiefs. Rather than destroying existing political entities, conquest, quote unquote, meant constructing new ones, new entities out of a relatively dispersed population. These new entities were the Filipino pueblos, the towns, the bayan. Pueblos were the offshoot of a process called the reduction, the concentration and resettlement of inhabitants within hearing distance of the church bells. There's, listen, there's little reason to believe that the resettlement of people around the church or the formation of towns was the outcome of bloody conquest, enslavement, or coercion. The archipelago was at the other end of the world from Spain, whose economic and military resources simply did not allow for a replay of the enslavement of the Native Americans. As I said earlier, there were a few armed clashes, especially in the areas where the inhabitants had been converted to Islam. But these were the exception rather than the rule. The so-called conquest of the Philippines was accomplished mainly through soft power, through treaties, blood compacts, and the introduction of a new and powerful religion, Roman Catholicism. 
We must resist the temptation to put into one basket, which we have labeled the Castilla colonizers, those Iberians who arrived in the 16th century. These clerics belong to the generation of Santa Teresa of Avila, San Juan de la Cruz, St. John of the Cross, I mean, St. Ignatius of Loyola, and many other exemplary Spanish Catholics. They represented a revitalization of the faith in the face, in the face of the challenge of Martin Luther. Missionaries who were sent to the Indies were for the most part genuinely inspired to spread the gospels. They had to prove to the early Filipinos that their religion was superior to the existing ones. And they did their best in demonstrating that superiority. They were wise enough to allow Christianity to be localized or indigenized in order to facilitate its adoption. The missionaries even defended the new converts against abuses by military personnel and, and uh, of course, the encomenderos. Yet, ironically, in the eyes of most Filipinos today, these missionaries were just one of them, Castilla invaders, and are best forgotten. The, mis the Muslims in the South, meanwhile, still revere the Arab and other foreign missionaries who brought Islam to Sulu and Mindanao. To the pagan inhabitants of Luzon, the Visayas, and northern Mindanao, the religion of the Spaniards was quite impressive. In particular, the younger generation, the sons and daughters of the Datus, the Rajas, and the Maginoo, were so taken in by this new faith that they collaborated with the missionaries in converting their elders to Christianity. We might say that the conversion to Christianity was the first of four waves of external influences that affected mainly the youth of society over the centuries. The second wave was that of the European Enlightenment, which culminated in the French Revolution. It took a century before this wave, before the French Revolution became the Philippine Revolution in the, in the 1890s. It particularly took hold among the young people who could read Spanish, such as Rizal, Aguinaldo, and Bonifacio, whom I shall talk about later. The third wave of foreign influence was brought on by the system of, of universal education established by the American colonizers from 1901. This led to the entrenchment of a liberal and Anglo-American mindset among a new generation of young Filipinos, exemplified by my, by my father himself, who was born in 1920. The fourth and most recent wave arrived in two stages. First, in the aftermath of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and then in 1949, with the triumph of the Chinese Revolution led by Mao Zedong. This led to the radicalization of more generations of, of young Filipinos in the 1930s, and again in the late 1960s, which is where I would situate, situate myself, actually. Of these four waves, four waves of quite revolutionary influences, the conversion to Christianity was, in my view, the most profound in shaping what Filipinos today are as a people. Of course, the scope of the present Philippine Republic has expanded way beyond the Spanish Pueblo, uh, the, the Spanish Filipino Pueblos in the 16th and 17th centuries. The Philippines differs from Filipinas in the inclusion of upland societies, the plurality of religions, the separation of church and state, the shift from Castilian to English as a lingua franca, and many other characteristics. The transformations of the, 20th, of the 20th century, however, can never obliterate what was formed out of 300 years of Spanish influence in the lowlands at least. Religious conversion produced a new social and moral order centered on the Catholic Church and presided over by a Spanish friar. The towns or pueblos that were founded along these lines in the 16th and 17th centuries would form the nucleus of the future nation state. For this reason alone, the quincentennial celebration ought to be taken dead seriously. There are a lot of documents in the archives about the foundation of towns and their development over the centuries. If we put together the histories of these towns, we should theoretically be able to construct the history of Las Islas Filipinas. 
But as Filipino students know from their textbooks, the histories of towns and everyday life under a Spanish Catholic order are overshadowed by the many revolts that took place over the course of Spanish rule. But what really were these revolts all about? In most cases, you will find that the revolt was about people abandoning their pueblos and moving to the peripheries and beyond, where the Spanish authorities lacked the power to impose their will upon them. Sometimes the movement away from the town center was due to dissatisfaction with certain aspects of Christian life and a corresponding desire to return to earlier religious practices. Or perhaps a prominent local figure, perhaps a cabeza de barangay or even a gobernadorcillo might get involved in a dispute with a Spanish priest or official and would runs who abandoned the pueblos and moved to the, to the hinterlands or had actually committed serious crimes like murder, corruption, and uh, uh, rape and, and other uh, crimes of that sort. Let us not romanticize this process of leaving the settled pueblos in order to return to the hills. In any case, the frequent, frequent appearance of revolts in the historical record is an indication that Pueblo history, the history of the Bayan Bayanan, can only give us a partial image of the past. Pueblo history consisting of the activities of the Catholic priests, the local officials, both Indio and Spanish, and the Taong Bayan, is only the more visible or documented part of the country's history. For every town that was established, there was another space, potentially more extensive than the Pueblo, that was inhabited by the apostates, the sectas, the colorum, the vagamundos, the tulisanes, and above all, the indocumentados, the undocumented. These were the Taong Labas, the people in the outside of the town, or beyond the town center. That there, could be, that there could be an autonomous zone beyond the Pueblo was because Spanish control over the population, at least until 1800, was based mainly on the moral power of the church convento center. To the local elites, there were both spiritual and material advantages to living close to the center and working together with the Spanish establishment. If for whatever reason these Indios abandoned the Pueblo center, and decided to live beyond Spanish control, there was really little that the friars and the local police could do to prevent it. Not at least until the Guardia Civil and the Spanish army were reorganized and reinforced in the 19th century, 300 years after the arrival of Magellan. Only then could the Spanish state forcibly impose control over the semi-autonomous zones beyond the Pueblos. The, the, the town, the Bayan, and the, Pueb and the spaces beyond its control were not entirely separate spaces, however. There was movement back and forth, and a key interface between the two was the town mayor and his associates. The mayor, who was called at various times the gobernadorcillo, capitan municipal, or presidente, but was the point of contact between the local community, the Spanish religious, and the secular rulers. Once elected and proclaimed, the mayor of a pueblo had to work together with a Spanish friar during his term of office. This was his first major duty as mayor. After all, the, Spanish, the, the parish priest, the cura parroco, was no less than the representative of the Spanish monarch as well as the pope. And the mayors had to deal with them. I think one of the weakest uh, aspects of uh, one of the... Uh, weak points in, in research on early Philippine history is uh, on the um, activities of the um, town elites, especially the, the mayors and the um, other uh, local or Indios with, with uh, positions of authority. Let us not forget that the highest position that an Indio could obtain was that of mayor. Above the mayor, the Spaniards, um, Spaniards were in, were uh, 
the holders of such positions. Um, and yet, of course, the, the, the word mayor has quite negative associations at present. And even the head of our country today, having been a mayor in the past, uh, is not considered to be a positive uh, development. But that is due to a bias, which uh, I have discussed a bit more in my book, uh, Knowledge and Classification. So I won't go into that now. Up to the early 19th century, the Spanish presence in the pueblos was minimal owing to manpower and budgetary shortages. Unlike in the Americas, relatively few Spaniards chose to migrate to the Philippines, and those who did so lived in Manila and other major cities and towns. And so the Spanish priests and a few other local, uh, a few other Spanish officials were the only uh, Spaniards around to govern a town comprised of thousands of Indians. So the idea was for a smooth relationship to be nurtured between the mayor and the friar, which was a crucial relationship for the well-being of the Pueblo at large. This relationship would provide valuable lessons for municipal elites in, in how to deal realistically with an external power personified in the Spanish officials, particularly the friar, uh, lessons in how to collaborate, how to resist, manipulate, and negotiate with, and or if necessarily, uh, if necessary, yield to this power with the survival and well-being of the community in mind. So after the Spaniards, the, you know, the, there were lessons to be learned about how to deal with the Americans, the Japanese, and other uh, external powers that have and might um, arrive in the Philippines. Now, like, um, well, going back to the friars and the mayors, the, the friars could be quite vocal in their attacks on corrupt and, and, and uncooperative mayors. But mayors, for their part, when dealing with friars, who happened to be arrogant and abusive, had to be patient and crafty in handling such issues. They had to implement non-confrontational resistance. But we must not exaggerate the tensions that might have existed between the friar and the local community. The Spanish priest did a decent job of ministering to his flock, despite his parishioners belonging to a different culture and speaking a different, lang a different language. The extremely negative image of the friar that we associate with the time of the revolution is largely a product of anti-clerical writings from the 18th century onwards that were adapted to the Philippine situation by the illustrados. Marcelo del Pilar's picture of a philocracy in the Philippines must be seen not as a snapshot of reality, but as a propaganda weapon in the illustrado attempt to bring down the Spanish religious political order in the islands. Unlike the American teachers who were to replace them in the 20th century, the Spanish missionaries in the 16th and 17th centuries did not teach their language to more than a tiny mi minority of their converts and parishioners, namely the principales who lived closest to the, to the church center. The friars had to learn the languages of their parishioners in order to deliver credible sermons and hear confessions. This should make us pause and think, of, think you know, about what if the American teachers behaved like the Spanish missionaries and instead taught us about liberalism and democracy in our own languages. What kind of people would, be, would we be then if the new American rulers learned our languages instead? The fact that the Spanish missionaries and the friars who served as Paris until 1898, had to learn Cebuano, Tagalog, Pangasinan, etc., etc., should force us to rethink what the Spanish conquest really meant. For this linguistic scenario offered a big advantage to the town mayor and other local elites and to the people at large. But we, did, we never lost our indigenous languages, unlike the, uh, the victims of uh, colonial oppression elsewhere including the Americas in particular. Anyway, the friars, even the best speakers of the vernaculars among them, were no match 
for the local leader, the mayors especially, who could verbally appeal to their constituents in a manner that could move them emotionally. Just watch the, the way that people with, with a long background in, uh, in local administration can deliver speeches compared to those who um, have not had such a background in politics. So in matters of peace and order, to give an example, the Spanish friar was actually indebted to the local mayor. While, it, while the detachment of the Guardia Civil could establish peace and order by force, this was transient and unstable. Mayors could, could talk effectively, not just to their followers, but to the leaders of, of this of disgruntled Taong Labas to make pulong even with bandit chiefs in order to neutralize their threats by making deals with them to avoid more dangerous or more serious damage to the community. This was the general situation during the first two centuries of Spanish rule. After 1800, however, major changes started to take place in the economy and local politics. I won't go into this, but just to give you uh, some general observations, the British occupation of Manila had made evident the determination of the British Empire to put an end to the empire of their Spanish rivals. This is a crucial background to the 19th century, which we have often missed in our textbook histories. But in fact, the Philippine Revolution was also a British imperial project. Working through Masonic lodges, which were originally founded in England in 1717, literature targeting the dominance of the Catholic Church began to spread throughout the Spanish Empire. The ultimate aim of the British was to cripple Spain's Pearl of the Orient by first taking control of the external trade of the Philippine colony, and second, by undermining the religious political foundations of, on which the Spanish Empire was built. By the 1860s, Manila was fully integrated into the British trading and financial network centered in Hong Kong and Singapore, which also became the channels through which subversive literature and ideas were introduced to the Philippines. By the 1880s, the popularity of anti-clerical literature targeting the Spanish friars would bring about drastic changes in the political structure of the Filipino Pueblo and the sentiments of the Taong Bayan. The gobernadorcillos and cabezas would become more assertive toward the friar core rulers or associates. from Rizal to Pardo de Tavera, followed by the history spent by American educated writers, the image of Spanish rule as a dark age began to take hold. Uh, let me treat this uh, in, in, in more detail by uh, dwelling a little bit on the biographies of three of our well-known or best-known heroes of the 19th century. Let's start with Rizal. Ever since he attended his uh, or started his secondary schooling in Manila, the Pueblo ceased to be his world. Eventually, he moved from Manila to Madrid and other parts of Europe, where his involvement with the propaganda movement 
and the writing of his two novels in Spanish basically made his career. Rizal's novels reflect his readings on Spanish, French, and American history. He was the best example of a Filipino illustrator who had embraced the modern world that was being formed at that time. The rural Philippines depicted in the Noli Metangere are not derived from passages in a town dweller's diary, but they are imagined scenes or scenarios of events in the towns under the grip of vicious, greedy, and greedy and immoral friars and their native puppets. Prototypical pueblos like San Diego needed to be transformed by putting the friars in their place and allowing enlightened, forward-looking locals to take charge. This was, this was one of the goals of the propaganda movement. Results positioning in the social landscape enabled him to broadcast his liberal reformist aims to fellow liberals in Spain, as well as the Spanish-educated elite in the Philippines. However, the vast majority of the population that could not read Spanish was largely unaware of Rizal's existence and certainly did not know what his novels were all about. It was only after Rizal's dramatic trial and execution that he became a household word, the Filipino Christ. Rizal's writings were not for the masa, but for people like himself, Spanish literate members of the town elite, who hopefully could be made to understand where the world was heading in the aftermath of the liberal revolutions in France and America. Rizal's goal was to wean the town elites away from the friars that they had been collaborating with and to place them on the path to modernity so that they would carry forward in their train the so-called poor and ignorant elements of society. Now let's talk about Andres Bonifacio, another of our best known heroes. He was another mestizo actually from the lower middle class whose family, unlike Rizal, did not have the means to have him formally educated, much less sent to Europe for advanced studies. Nevertheless, Bonifacio was an avid self-taught reader of Spanish books. We know, we know that he struggled to, to read Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, or Les Miserables in Spanish. The French and American revolutions that he had learned about through his reading of books and pamphlets provided the lens through which he could interpret the Filipino past. His idea of, a, of revolution was derived from the radical literature of his time that romanticized the French Revolution rather than from any serious study of how a revolution could arise from the unique experience of Spanish Filipinas. As Jim Richardson convincingly demonstrated in his book, The Light of Liberty, quote, the ideals that resound loudest and clearest in the documents of the Katipunan are the same ideals as the revolutionaries in France proclaimed in 1789 and 1848. And as were printed in large type on the certificates of the Masonic lodges, the great trilogy of liberty, equality, and fraternity, end quote. And as I demonstrated in my old book, Passion and Revolution, Bonifacio's main contribution to the revolution together with his comrade Emilio Asinto was to translate or to, to transpose into the vernacular the anti-clerical and nationalist ideas that he had absorbed or they had absorbed from the literature that was circulated by their fellow Masons, Freemasons. But Nefasha's facility with the Tagalog language as well as his dedication to the Katipunan cause enabled him to rally some, some people from the poorer classes in Manila to join his movement. But we must not forget that the leadership of the Katipunan was mainly middle class and well-educated. A good number of them had traveled regularly to Hong Kong and Singapore for business and work. And no doubt these outposts of the British Empire were the main channels to which anti-clerical and anti-colonial writings reached Filipinas. Formerly uh, a clerk messenger, messenger for the British firm, J.M. Fleming and Company, and a supply clerk and sales agent of the German house, Carlos Fressel and Company, Andres Bonifacio had been radicalized by the writings of the propaganda and Freemasonry. He was a Manilenio 
who was thrust into the rural environment of Cavite, which was in was which was alien territory for him, because that's where the mayors and the friars ruled. He addressed his Katipunan counterpart there as Capitan, not in reference to Aguinaldo's military rank, but to his reputation as Capitan Municipal of Cavite Viejo. So let's turn uh, now to uh, Aguinaldo. Well, he could have joined the ranks of the Ilustrados, but his schooling in Manila had to be terminated so that he could attend to his family business upon his father's death. He had picked up liberal ideas from a Masonic lodge founded by a native Filipino priest and was duly inducted into the Katipunan, but he was still a town mayor then, and his duties entailed close collaboration with the parish priests, the friar. When he appeared at the head of the rebel forces in Cavite, Spanish officialdom treated Aguinaldo as a rogue mayor, deserving of death or treachery. While Aguinaldo clearly believed that the time had come to put an end to the Spanish clergy's domination of society, he didn't view the friars as a class, but rather judged them in terms of their work in their parishes. By his account, for example, he pleaded with with Bonifacio to spare the lives of two of the three Spanish friars who had been taken into custody by the Magdalo, but had been entrusted to the rival Magdiwang party headed by Bonifacio. Aguinaldo's reasoning was that the two priests were men of, in his words, genuinely good character, talagang mabay. But Bonifacio, but Bonifacio scornfully rejected Aguinaldo's pleas for clemency and had this uh, had all of three of them executed. So in his letters and manifest, manifestos, Bonifacio comes out as categorically anti-friar and anti-Catholic. As far as he was concerned, all Spanish, all Spanish friars were false preachers who pretended to be holy men while inflicting untold cruelties on the people. This is the discourse that still influences the way we commemorate the 16th century, the, uh, the coming of Magellan. In any case, Bonifacio had vowed to execute any of them, any of the priests who fell into his hands. His fate was thus sealed when, was, when he moved from metropolitan, metropolitan Manila, the center of international trade and which was de facto a satellite of the British Empire to the pueblos of Cavite province. The municipal elites of Cavite, to be sure, had been partly radicalized by the writings of Rizal and the moving manifestos of the Katipuna. But Pueblo society continued to develop according to its own centuries-old rhythms. Bonifacio's hatred of the Spanish clergy, his bitter rejection, of an election that deprived him of power, although it may have been rigged, his refusal to transform his secret society into a mass movement, and his attempt to form his own army in Cavite soon cast him and his remaining followers as Taong Labas. Aguinaldo's more nuanced attitude toward the friars, in contrast, his willingness even to make peace deals brokered by Spanish Jesuit is indicative of his previous experience as town mayor. Unlike Bonifacio, he was, unlike Bonifacio who was driven by ideology, Aguinaldo was a pragmatist. He had learned to act in the interests of his constituents, such as mediating between autocratic friars and their congregation, congregation in the 1890s, or making peace deals with bandits and insurgents. Modern scholarship has not been sympathetic to Aguinaldo, however. Rizal's portrayal in his novels of corrupt or friar conniving mayors was picked up by American propagandists who put Aguinaldo in a bad light as a typical cacique, a violence-prone despot whose control over his followers spurred, him, spurred them to continue to resist American rule. Aguinaldo and his officer corps are labeled as caciques, thereby emptying of meaning their resistance to the American invasion. Yet without Aguinaldo and other nationalists with a rural background, 
the Katipunan would have remained an urban middle class movement and the armed resistance to American occupation would have fizzled out much earlier due to the lack of manpower. In conclusion, the Philippines today has not quite recovered from the effects of the destruction of the Spanish Filipino religious politi political order that had functioned very well for, for over two centuries since the Spanish conquest. It worked because the, because the church convent center was able to fulfill, it function, fulfill its functions. It worked because Catholicism had been embraced by the uh, masses, at least in the pueblos. I mean, one of the things that puzzled me when I was interviewing my elders back in the 1960s, when I first got into history, was the way they talked about daily life in the 19th century and, and how daily life, uh, you know, operated according to uh, a rhythm established by religious, religious conventions and, and how, in their view, the local elites were not corrupt at all. And yet when you read modern textbooks, it, seemed, it would seem that the origins of corruption in society today is being attributed to the corrupt practices of the Spanish Catholic religious political order. This is an effect of American historiography, by the way, and I discussed this in my, in my still fairly recent book, uh, Knowledge and Pacification, which unfortunately is not being given the attention I had hoped. Um, in any case, to go back to my conclusion, when the revolution destroyed the dominance of the uh, church convent center in the town, um, I wonder what happened to my video. Um, Let me, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you, but yes, you have yes. no image. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened to you. Okay, my... it's okay. Uh, Go on. I think my, my, my battery has, yeah, I, unfortunately, uh, I'm using a, I'm using a webcam, which is, uh, which is battery operated. And I think it has just stopped working. Sorry, I will, I, will, uh, I will switch to the computer later on, but I, let me just read the rest of my talk, okay? Okay, uh, okay, go on. Um, when, the, when the revolution destroyed the dominance of the church convento center in the, town, in the towns, the challenge from then on was to establish another, another kind of order in its place. There was a brief period from the proclamation of independence in 1898 to the outbreak of war with the U.S. in 1899, when the church convento complex, now in the hands of the Filipino priests, was united with the civil administration, the townspeople, and even the taulabas. But the First Republic was subsequently destroyed by the Americans, thus bringing to a conclusion the century-old project of the British Empire to dismantle the Spanish regime in the Philippines, in Filipinas, and to place it in the hands of Anglo-Saxon rulers and their liberal Filipino wards. Las Islas Filipinos, Las Islas Filipinas would then become the Philippine Islands, which was a truly revolutionary transformation. We need to understand what was lost when the revolutions of the 19th and 20th century swept through not just Filipinas, but the world at large and destroyed much of the old order. That is why a serious commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the arrival of Spain and the creation of Filipinas is needed. More research needs to be done on the nature of the conquest of the islands through Spanish soft power and how the Taong Bayan, Taong Labas dichotomy was thereby established. We need to appreciate the gravity of the 19th century challenge to a Filipino Christian moral and social order facilitated by our own scholars and writers who were mesmerized by the second wave of foreign influence, the Enlightenment, Enlightenment thought 
and liberalism. American rule firmly established a liberal interpretation of 300 years of Spanish rule. Which brings me to the topic of this panel, which is emancipating the Philippines from Spanish colonial history, question mark. I'm not so sure uh, that this question really covers what I have been saying in my talk. Perhaps the real challenge is to emancipate the Philippines from American, American colonial history or American era colonial history. I think that's the challenge that uh, we are facing in trying to come to grips with what happened 500 years ago. Thank you very much. Okay, thank that's... Uh, thank you, uh, Ray, for that enlightening uh, uh, talk. And uh, let me now move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Jaime Veneracion. Our next speaker is a retired professor uh, history of history from the Department of History, UP Diliman, and an active historian of and on Bulacan. Mariano Ponce, who is seated in a photo showing Jose Rizal and Marcelo H. Del Pilar, hails from Baliwag, Bulacan. Dr. Jaime Veneracion has written a book on him entitled Mariano Ponce y Coliantes, Makabayan, Bayani. Dr. Veneracion is an advisor of the Samahan Pangkasaysayan ng Bulacan or Sampaca. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Jaime Veneracion. Jimmy, unmute, please. Jimmy, kindly unmute. Ah, yeah, okay. Oh, sige. Salamat. Uh, magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat at ang uh, pamagat ng aking panayam ay ang historiografiya sa panahon ni Mariano Ponce at ng mga ilustrado. Hayaanin niyo yung simulan ko ang aking panayam sa pagunita sa konferensyang ginanap sa UP may 32 taon na nakakalipas. Ang tinutukoy ko ay ang unang konferensya sa historiografiya na ginanap upang uh, i-commemorate o ipagtiwang ang isa pang konferensya na ginawa naman ni Jose Rizal. Ngunit ito hindi natuloy. Ito yung konferensya sa Paris bilang komemorasyon sa Revolusyon Pranses noong 1789. Katulad ng tema na ginagawa natin ngayon sa ating patitipon, ang konferensya ay isang pagtataya ng mga pagsusulat ng kasaysayan sa nakaraang isang daan taon. At kung gayon, kung titingnan natin ang kasalubuhin nating ginagawa, ito ay isang pagpapatuloy ng pagtatasa noong 1989. Ang konferensyang ginanap sa UP ay nagbigay silang sa samang adiga ng Pilipinas o ang asosasyon ng mga dalubhasa, may hilig, at interes sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas. Ang katitika ng nasabing pagditipon ay naisaklat na pam na sa pamamatnugot ni na Bernadette Abrera at Dedina Lapar. At may pamagat ito, ito po yung aklat. May kita mamaral din yun, andyan yung aklat. Ang pamagat nito ay paksa, paraan at pananaw sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas. 
Ngayon, tulad ng nabanggit ko, pinagpapatuloy natin ang talakayan noong 1989. Isang pagtaya o pagtataya sa pagsulong ng ating disiplina sa nakalipas na mahigit na tatlong pong taon. Sa panyayan ni Dr. Malu Kamagay, uh, ay aking tatalakay ng paraan, paksa at pananaw ng henerasyon ni Mariano Ponce. Ibig kong salungguhitan ang salitang panahon, panahon ni Ponce, sapagat hindi lamang ito tungkol kay Ponce, ito ay tungkol din sa kanyang mga kapanalig. Ang pangunahin dyan, ay ang leader ng kilusang revolusyonaryo sa Europa, si Dr. Jose Rizal. Gusto ko rin uh, banggitin na uh, isang mahalagang kapanalig ni Ponce, si Antonio Marihidor, na ang tahanan sa London ang tinirahan ni Rizal habang ginagawa ang anotasyon kay Morga noong 1888. Sa Kerenidor, nagmula ang ideya ng pagkakadugtong-dugtong ng kasaysayan ang pinakahalimbawa para maunawaan ito ay ang pariralang walang gumbursa noong 1872. Kung walang gumbursa noong 1872, wala rin ang revolusyon ng 1896. Sa game, Rehidor din ang galing ang tesis na geografiya ang nagtatakda ng karakter o kultura ng isang pangkat ng tao. At binigyan niya ng halimbawa sa mga Ingles kung ikumpara sa mga Espanyol. Ang mga Ingles sa ayon sa kanya ay tahimik, formal at kalmado. Kumpara sa mga Espanyol na masayahin at makwento. Dahil di umano ito sa pagkatira ng mga Ingles sa mas malamig na klima. Sa Pilipinas, ang pagkakaroon ng maraming pulo at pagtira sa sonong tropikal ay dapat pag-aralan upang maunawaan ang ating pambansang karakter. Sa lalangan politika, pinaliwanag ni Rehidor, ang pagkahiwalay ng pag-unlad ng tinatawag niyang nasyon at ang tinatawag niyang gobyerno o estado. Na maaaring mabuo at umunlad ang bayan Samantalang naiiwan sa pagunlad ang Estado o vice versa. Sa konferensya sa Paris na inorganisa noong 1889, pagkamat hindi ito natuloy, may isang balangkas ng pagsasakal sa isaya na inihanda si Rizal. Ito ang platforma niya sa pag-anyaya sa mga ekspertong Europeo tulad ng kaibigan niyang si Blumentritt at maraming iba pa. Kapansin-pansin sa balangkas na pinigyan din niya ang revolusyon ng 1812 sa Espanya bilang mahal, mahalagang bagtasan sa kasaysayan ng Pilipinas at ang pagbibigay din din o paglalagay ng napakaraming paksa nakaugnayin ng prehistorya tulad ng wika, etnolohiya, usaping pangka, pangkultura at pangkalinangan ng Pilipinas. Mahalaga sa kanilang kilusan ang revolusyon ng 1812 sa Espanya sapagat iyon ang nagdeklara ng El Pueblo Soberano 
O ang pagkilala sa pagkapantay-pantay ng mga tao bilang mamamayan o no, citizen. At ang paglaya na makapagpulong, mamahayag, sumapi sa anumang relihiyon at iba pa. Iba pa pang mga karapatang pantato. Ang ikalawa, ang prehistoria ay mahalaga ayong kay Rizal sapagat ito ang batayan ng pagkakaroon ng isang inang bayan na nandiyan na bago dumating ang mga Kastila. Nang dumating nga ang mga Kastila ayong kay Rizal, napiit ang inang bayan at kailangan ng pagtubos o redemption. Sa pamamagitan ng pagdilig ng dugo at pawis ng mga anak ng bayan, ang tinatawag natin ngayon na heroic ideal ng mga ilustrado. Sa kanyang mga sinulat, pinanggit ni Rizal na ang susi sa pagkatuklas ng mga Pilipino sa kanilang identidad. At upang maunawaan ang kanilang sarili, kailangan bumalik sa prehistoria. Sapagat doon matutuklasan nila ang kanilang magandang katangian bilang tao. Mula sa mga katangiang iyon, maititindig ang nasyon o ang bayan na noong paman ay buhay, malusog at puno ng enerhiya. Sa isang lektura sa mga scholar sa Alemanya, nabanggit ni Rizal ang kwentong bayan, yung tunggoy at ang pagong na nabasa niyang meron din pala sa Timog, Hapon, sa kwentong kalat sa daigdig na malayo. Nawi kanya, ang kwentong bayang ito ay pamana o inheritance ng isang nawala o instinct na sibilisasyon. Kaya natungo ang interes ni Rizal sa lawak ng sonang kultural na ito na isang kamalayang nabuo rin sa mga kapwa ilustrado kasama na si Ponce. Ang sonang kultural na ito ay tinatawag ngayon natin na astronesiano. Sa kagustuhang mataro, ang panimulang nilalaman ng kaalamang ito Sinali ni Rizal ang pag-aaral ni Theodore White tungkol sa pagkatatag ng wikang Malayo Polynesiano at ang pagkakaroon ng mga salitang may kaugnayan sa isa't isa sa malawak na daigdig ng Malay at Polynesiano. Napuna ng preba na pinag-aralan ni White at ni Parda de Tabera, ang tungkol sa mga salitang Sanskrit sa Tagalog. Ayong kay Tabera, ang paghiwalay sa Malayo at Polynesia ay ayon sa pagkakaroon ng Sanskrit sa Malay at ang kawalan nito sa mga lugar ng mga kapuluang Polynesia. Ang anotasyon kay Morga ay pagpapatuloy ng pag-ungkat sa unang kabihas ng ito ng pundasyon na sinasabi niyang inang bayan. Maraming obserbasyon si Morga tungkol sa paghahabi, pagmimina at pagpapanday ang paggawa ng bangka at iba pang teknolohiya na ang iba ay nawala na. Inihalimbawa ni Rizal ang obserbasyon ni Morga Tungkol sa paggawa ng kanyon ni Panday Pira, isang kakayahan na nawala sa panahon ng mga Kastila. Nang dumating ang mga Kastila, ang inang bayan ay kinilalan ni Rizal at ng mga ilustrado. Na hindi dapat ituring ng kolonya. Ang pakto di sangre ang patunay na isang kasunduan ng pagtutulungan at hindi pagsabok ang naganap noong 1565. Malinaw sa pakto na kapalit ng matapat (coughs) 
malinaw sa pakto. Ang patunay na isang kasunduan at pagtutulungan at hindi pagsawa pa naganap noong 1565. Sabi niya, malinaw sa pakto, nakapalit ng matapat na pakikisama at kaunting tributo bilang pagkilala sa hari. May katungkulan ng mga Kastila na proteksyonan at bigyang ginhawa ang mga katutubo. Bagay na hindi naganap. Noong mga taong 1891, ito ang bataya ng panawagan ni Rizal sa pagkalas ng bayan sa Madre, Espanya. Ngayon, tumungo naman tayo sa eponsimismo na isang, taga, isang kaibigan at kasama ni Rizal. Ating tandaan na si Ponce ay gumamit ng mga sagisag patulat Nakatipo, lako at tikbalang. Dalawang salita, yung kalipo, lako at tikbalang, na pumakatawan sa dalawang aspekto ng paglaya. Kalipo, lako ang pangalan ng bayani sa Maktan na nagtanggol sa teritoryong geografikal na isang aksyong politikal sapagkat usapin ito ng soberanya. Samantala, tikbalang ang sumasagisag sa paglayang kultural. Kapagat ayong kay Ponce, ang mga aswang, tikbalang, mga anito na kinatatakutan, mga espiritu sa kagubatan at kadiliman ay hindi nasabog ng mga Kastila. Sa kaibutura ng ating paniniwala at pagmumuni-muni, nananatili tayong malaya. Pagamat sa panlabas na kaanyuan ay nandoon ang kristyanismo na lumukog sa ating bayan. Ano ang ibig sabihin na, o ang silbi ng mga sagisag panulat na ito? Para kay Ponce, may pang ilalim na geografiya ng bayan na nanatili ang kaluluwa. Nakikita sa ibang espekto ng kalinangan tulad ng wika, yung ating mga panlasa, ang ating mga ugali, na nandun na at naging isang bahagi ng ating pagkatao. Yon ang tinatawag, ang tatawagin kong inner geography na ipinaliliwanag ni Ponce. Ayon sa kanya, may mga halimbawa tulad ng sarong bayani ng mga Tagalog na may versyon din sa Ilocano, Sangkabagi, sa folklore na natipon niya sa iba't ibang lugar, ay nakita niya na ang mga ito ang mga laso o magpapahaba ng laso na nagbibigkis sa ating mga Pilipino. Sa puntong ito, uh, nais kong bigyan pansin ang mga sulatin mismo ni Ponce na kaugnay sa pagsasakasaysayan ng kanyang kapanahonan. Ginamit ng salita ang kaugnay sapagkat maliban sa mga huling taon ng kanyang buhay, nang sulatin niya ang isang historia de Bulacan, ang mga ulat niya ay hindi ayon sa mga naunawa nating pagsasakasaysayan. Kasi sa ating disiplina, alam natin na di lamang pagpukolekta at pagsamsam ng mga datos at facts ang historia. Mas sentral sa pagiging historiador ang paghabi ng mga facts at mga nangyaring uh, at uh, yung mga historical facts ay ating hinahabi upang maging isang naratibo o salaysay. May dalawang sulati na natipon bilang kompilasyon na naisagawa si Ponce. Ang una 
naging kompilasyon ang kanyang koleksyon ng mga may ikling talambuhay na may pamagat na Epimerides. Katunayan si Malu ang isa sa mga editor o patnugot ng na nasa bing koleksyon. Andun din yung kanyang mga notas uh, katipuneskas. At ang ikalawa, yung mga notas historikas na kung tutusin ay regular ng mga picture, article sa pahayagan la solidaridad. Sa ngasa ng Epimerides, ang uh, dahilan ng pagkagawa nito ay ayon sa payo na rin ni Jose Rizal. Payong kay Rizal, ang mga bayani ng bayan na nagdulot at nagpangkita ng mga bagay na magpapataas sa pagtingin natin sa ating sarili bilang isang pangkat ng tao at bilang mamayan ay dapat matandaan, hindi lamang sa pangalan. Sigit pa roon, dapat natin silang makilala sa particular na contribution nila sa lipunan na may pagunawa sa kanilang kapaligirang kinalawan at sa mga hamon na kanilang kinaharap o naigpawan upang matamo ang kanilang mga tagumpay. Sa mga notas historikas naman, ang pagsasalaysay ay hindi na ayon sa isang kronolohikal na pag-aayos. Kaya kailangang malaman ang balangkas ng kamalayan ng manunulat na si Ponce para maunawaan natin kung bakit niya inilagay yung mga item na yon. Ang isang halimbawa ay ang ilang ulit na paglalathala niya ng huling habilin at testamento ni Reina Isabela I la Catolica na nasulat noong taong 1504. Ang pecha, kung titingnan natin, ay labas na sa pagdating ng mga Kastila sa Pilipinas. Pero hindi rin masabi na bahagi ito ng prehistorya ng Pilipinas. Ngunit dahil ito magpapaliwanag sa kahulugan ng sandugo o pacto di sangre, naging makabuluhan ito upang bigyang linaw ang diwa, ang katangian o essence ng pacto di sangre. Ayong kay Ponce, hindi dapat ito ring ang kanilang pagdating, ang pagdating ng mga Kastila bilang pagsakop. Sapagat ayon sa Reina, ang katutubo ay dapat iangat ang kondisyon sa pagiging kristyano at sibilisado. Ang paggalang sa kanilang kaugalian, ang pagmamahal na dapat igawad sa kanila bilang kapwa kristyano. Kaya inihalintulad niya ang papel ng mga Kastila sa isang iyaya na ang tungkulin ay uh, turuan ang batang paslit sa kanyang paglaki. At kung meron na siyang sapat na karunungan at kakayahan, hayaan siyang maging malaya o magkaroon ng independensya. Kaya ang sandugo ay nasa diwa ng kasunduan. Hindi ito nasa diwa ng pananako. Uh, sa ganitong konteksto ay dapat uh, irespeto ng mga kastilang ang dinak na nilang mga kaugalian. Tulad 
ng ginawa ng mga monarkang besigodo sa Espanya. Nagkaroon sila ng mga medieval charter o yung tinatawag doon na fueros na sa ating pag-unawa ay isang kasunduan din. At ang paggalang sa karapatan ng mga katutubo sa lugar, yung mga tinatawag noon na Hispano-Romano, sa peninsula ng Iberia. Isang entry sa Notas Historicas na binanggit ni Ponce ay naayon sa kasundo ang Kastila at Katutubo. Isa rito ay ang pagbigay ng exception o estipendo sa mga namumunong angkan sa Cebu, yung mga tupas sa palibot ng Maynila, Pampanga at Butangan, yung mga Lakandula at Suliman, at sa, Kam- at sa Kabite, yung angka ng mga Mohika. Pinatunayan ng mga halimbawang ito, na sa simula, iginalang naman ng mga Kastila, yung habili na testamento ni Reina Isabela I. Bilang ganti, ang mga Pilipino noon ay naging katuwang sa, sa pag-supil uh, sa mga pag-aalsa ng mga Chino, sa Ternate, at ang paglaban sa digma, laban sa mga Olandes at Ingles. Isang uh, item din, bilang pagpapatunay ng paggalang dito sa kasunduan, ang uh, pagpayag o pag, uh, pagtatakda ng tinatawag na tanorya. Yung tanorya, ito yung libreng, uh, uh, ano ba tawag doon? Yung uh, parang alipin nito eh, uh, tanod. No? Yung alipin ng mga dato yung ating mga alipin sa gigilid. Tinawag itong tanorya sa, u- sa unang deka- uh, siglo ng okupasyong mga Kastila. At ayon kay Ponce, ito ay pinayagan na umiral sa panahon yun, sapagat yun ay bahagi ng kaugalian ng mga katutubo sa Pilipinas. Bukod sa sandugo, naging entry din ng, uh, ang mga pag-aaral sa prehistoria tulad ng panawagan ni Dr. Rizal. Sapagkat sa pamagitan nito, makikita ang bayan bilang may isang malusog na kabihasnan at may mataas na sibilisasyon. Isang entry tungkol sa mga sa prehistoria, ang saliksik ni Renhard Branstetter na nagpaliwanag sa lawak ng sinaunang sonang kultural ng uh, mga nagsasalita ng malayo polinisyano. Idinagdag ni Branstetter na sinusuga naman ni Alexander von Humboldt ang lista ng mga salitang lantay na nagpapakita ng ugnayan ng mga lipo ng malayong polinisyano. Si Humboldt sa katunayan na nagtaya sa Tagalog bilang pinakamagandang at pinakaperpektong halimbawa ng pamilyang ito ng wika. Tulad din ni Rizal, nasa liksik ni Ponce at lumabas na entry sa Notas Historicas, ang mga pag-uulat na may kaugnayan sa mga atutubo na may iba't ibang kasanayan. Merong entry tungkol kay Panday Pira, kay Tumas Pimpin, kay Nicolas Bagay, itong huli ang gumawa ng uh, mapa para kay Padre Murillo I. Bilarde. Ngunit, ang mas mahalaga na sinalangguhita ni Ponce ay ang pagkakaroon ng mga katutubo ng script 
na ngayon ay tinatawag natin baybayin, isang estilo ng pagsulat na ginamit ng mga katutubo, na ang bawat isa ay natutuhang mabasa ito at magsulat. Bawat isang katutubo noon, ngayon sa kanya, ay marunong sumulat at bumasa. Isang entry ay tungkol sa pagsunog ni Padre uh, Chirino ng isang aklat. Isang aklat na may pangmagat na golo. Koleksyon ng mga tula at awitin ayon kay Chirino na isinubo ng isang katutubo sa kanya at agad niyang inyotos na ito ay pasunog dahil likha ito ng demonyo. Kaya bilang anotasyon, sabi ni Ponce, ang golo ay guro. At ang mga tulat awit na nasa aklat ay gamit sa ritual ng pananampalataya. Sa pagsunog sa aklat, nawala ayon kay Ponce ang ebidensya ng literatura ng ating mga ninuno. Ngayon, doon sa puntong yon ay uh, nagkaroon ng mga entry tungkol sa mga abuso ng mga misinero o na tinatawag niya na Prile. Nandun yung pagpatay sa mga gobernador general tulad ni Diego Salcedo at ni Fernando Bustamante. Patay sa komplot ng mga prayle. Inanggit din dito ang prayer memorial ni Andasit di Salazar at ang kautusan tungkol sa sekularisasyon na ipinatupad ni Arsobispo Basilio Santa Justa Irupina na ito ayon sa kanya ang pinagmulan ng kilusang sekularisasyon na nagbigay daan sa gumbursa. Kaya ang buong mga entry na marami ito tungkol sa ikalabing siyam na dantaon ay tungkol sa mga uh, pag-alsa. Tungkol sa mga pag-alsa na nagsimula doon sa panahon ng uh, ang revolusyon ng El Pueblo sa Verano noong 1812. Dali lang po at na, nawaglit itong aking mga notes. Anyway, ang uh, sinasabi dito, Uh, yung 1812 na yon ang naging batayan ng uh, gilusang propaganda. Sapagkat mula doon sa gilusang mula doon sa konstitusyon na yon nagkaroon ng mga pag-aalsa, nandoon doon yung sarat, yung sabigan. Kasama na rin doon yung uh, pagkawala ng representasyon ng mga Pilipino na nabalik noong 1871 sa panahon ng uh, Republika sa Espanya, ngunit na walang muli sa panahon ng mga Borbon. Kaya kung titingnan natin, ang La Solidaridad sa kanyang unang editorial ay nagbanggit na layunin ng kanilang kilusan sa propaganda ay maibalik yung representasyon na yon nawala noong mga taong 1837 at pagkatapos ng Republika noong 1873. Uh, noong mga taong pumasok ang mga Amerikano sa Pilipinas, mga taong 1907, bumalik si Ponce at naging isang diputado sa Asimbleya Nasional. 
At sa panahon ito, ang isang proyekto na ginawa niya bilang deputado ay ang pag, pagbuo ng isang uh, Biblioteka Nasional, yung National Library. Ngunit kaiba ito doon sa National Library ng mga Kastila. Kasi ang magiging core collection ng library na ito ay ang mga Pilipinyana at yung mga yun nga, yung mga sulatin ng mga bayani natin noong 1896. Nandun doon din ang isang Asia section. No? Kasi nahilig si Ponce sa pag-aaral ng mga kapwa natin Asyano lalo na sa timog silang ang Asia. Naging katuwang niya rito si Teodoro M. Kalaw. At ang maganda rito, kumuha rin sila ng payo muli doon sa sinasabi ni uh, Antonio Marihidor. Sabi kasi ni Rihidor, sa loob ng dispensasyong Amerikano, pwede naman ng tinatawag niyang nasyon gubernamental. Sa isang banda, yung nasyon ay pwedeng paularin, tuloy-tuloy pa rin ang pag-unlad. Kung ating malilipon ang mga karanasan ng mga sinauna nating mga ninuno hanggang sa makarating sa ating panahon. Yung nasyon ay kaiba kaya sa estado. Sapagkat yung estado, maaaring magbago-bago yon At habang hindi sa atin ibinabalik, yung estado, paula rin natin ang nasyon. Kaya katuwang si uh, Teodoro M. Calau, nagbuo ng kilusan si Ponce at si Calau na ang tawag ay kilusan ng diwang ayumanggi o diwang Pilipino. Katunayan si uh, Calau ay uh, gumawa ng uh, isang aklat na kompilasyon o synthesis ng mga magagandang asal ng mga Pilipino sa sinaunang panahon. Kaya kung tutusin, ang kilusang diwang Pilipino ay pagsasabuhay ng mga nalilimutan o maaaring nalilimutan na ng uh, kasalukuyang henerasyon na dating kaugalian at kultura ng ating mga ninuno. Ayon sa Keponse, responsibilidad ng kasalukuyang mga scholar at ng mga matatalino sa ating lipunan na isalin sa bagong henerasyon ang mga kaisipang yon at kamalayang yon upang may pagpatuloy na buhay ang ating inambayan. Yun na po at maraming salamat sa inyong pakikinig. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. At uh, uh, parang nakikita kong may mga laso, no? dugtong-dugtong, may thread uh, mula dun sa Um, uh, talk ni uh, Ray uh, tungo sa iyo at siguro dahil nabanggit niyo pareho ang uh, blood compact uh, ito ang magiging paksa ng atin na uh, huling speaker so let me introduce uh, our last speaker for the morning who is Dr. Filimon, uh, Filomeno V. Aguilar Dr. Aguilar is a professor in the Department of History at Mayo de Manila University. He completed his PhD at Cornell University where he received the Lauriston Sharp Prize for Outstanding Contributions to Southeast Asian Studies. If Dr. Ileto is associated with his book, Passion and Revolution, uh, Dr. Aguilar is associated with his book, Clash of Spirits. His most recent work is Peripheries, Histories of Anti-Marginality, which was published in 2018. Dr. Aguilar was for a long time, eight years to be exact, the editor of Philippine Studies, 
historical and ethnographic viewpoints, a journal of the Ateneo de Manila University. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present Dr. Filomeno V. Aguilar. June, your turn. Thank you, Dr. Kamagay. Good morning to everyone. Marina Agapo. So, as Dr. Kamagay said, but I think the perspectives are very interesting because they're quite divergent. Okay, I will read my paper in the interest of time so that I can cover as much of it as possible. The question is, why were these islands seemingly subjugated by Spain with relative ease? As Odi Corpus asks, how could so many people be conquered by so few Spaniards? In the late 19th century, there was a standard answer. The blood compact, or in Spanish, Pacto de Sangre, as we've heard from Mariano Ponce. Although there were several blood compacts between local chiefs and Spanish conquistadors, the event in Bohol between Sicatuna and Miguel Lopez de Legaspi in 1565 became the most well-known, it became emblematic, and because this happened because of Juan Luna's painting of El Pacto de Sangre, which he completed in Paris in 1885. Marcelo del Pilar later credited Luna's painting for playing a pivotal role in the Illustrados historiography. He said, Luna's palette has rekindled the memory of the blood compact between Legaspi and Sicatuna, suggesting that the blood compact had passed from collective memory, but the painting had rekindled that memory. We are all familiar with Luna's painting. Sicatuna appears on the left side of the frame. His back is turned to the viewer, his left hand raising a cup. Located off center is Legaspi, who raises a cup with his right hand. Agustinian Andres the Udaneta stands nearest to Legaspi. Other Spaniards are portrayed in this scene. Across the dark background is the barely legible inscription, España R, referring to regnant Spain. Luna, I think, deliberately inscribed ambiguities in the Pacto de Sangre by creating visual imbalance. We see Sicatuna's back, but his face is an enigma. The Spaniards dominate while engaged in a ceremonial toast with a single native. The painting celebrates the reign of Spain, but also depicts a native custom in which the Spaniards are willing participants, implying Spanish recognition of indigenous practice. And so we are led to ask, what was this blood compact? <clears throat> in the pre-colonial age, the islanders held lavish feasts to build and cement alliances among rulers or chiefs and their followers. The forging of an alliance in order to prevent bloodshed or end a feud or warfare involve a ceremony in which drops of blood from the persons entering into this alliance were mixed in an alcoholic drink, which they then drank. These were localized events within a set of dyadic ties, <clears throat> two by two. The parties to such a pact, generally men, need not have been enemies, but the ritual sealed their relationship into a blood brotherhood or sworn brotherhood. <clears throat> Interestingly, the Spanish accounts did not disparage or look down on these blood oaths and did not condemn them as a heathen practice. On the contrary, the conquistadors participated in blood compacts with the understanding that it forged, quote unquote, friendship between two parties. Legaspi deliberately entered into blood compacts with indigenous rulers. Why? Because he was complying with the king's mandate issued in 1556 that conquest should be done through alliances with local chiefs based on lessons learned in the Americas. And there is now a literature emerging in the Americas that showed that the Spanish conquest was really achieved 
through what they called Indio Conquistadors. These were local allies in the conquest of the different empires because these local and other states had been subjugated by those empires, so they had access to grind. And so they thought this was a better strategy, and th therefore Legaspi had to enter into these blood compacts of alliance with local chiefs. In the blood compact, <clears throat> the desire by the islanders and the conqueror and the conquistadors coincided, although they understood friendship and alliance building in divergent ways. The Spaniards were unlikely to have seen the blood compact establishing blood brotherhood. In fact, Legaspi described the conquest as a series of pacts of vassalage between him and the native chiefs, which meant he asserted authority over his vassal's land and its inhabitants. But he also promised to protect them. On the part of the native chiefs, they were unlikely to have seen the ritual as enabling Legaspi to take possession and ownership of their land, which Legaspi thought it entitled him. The ancient blood oaths did not include takeover of a territory. Over three centuries later, a totally different social context prevailed, and the Ilustrados seemed unable to fathom the pre-colonial framework of meaning and of what happened in 1565 despite determined efforts to reconnect with the past. The Ilustrados thus narrated the Pacto de Sangre in the specific context of their own political agenda rather than in terms of history. Del Pilar framed his reading of the blood oath in Bohol as commencing the Spanish colonization of the islands he had come to know as Las Islas Filipinas. Del Pilar opened his track, La Soberania Monacal en Filipinas, by recalling the blood oath. He said, three centuries have passed since the blood of Legaspi and Sicatuna blended in a cup that both men consumed in a sign of eternal friendship. They celebrated their oath to fuse together from then on into a single ideal, the aspirations of Spain and the Philippines. Influenced by European concepts, Del Pilar saw the blood compact as a country-to-country -country agreement, even when a political entity called the Philippines had not existed. Del Pilar regarded Sicatuna as if he were a sovereign who had authority to negotiate a contract on behalf of a country. Del Pilar interpreted the mingling of Sicatuna and Legaspi's blood as blending the aspirations of two countries, presumably equals. Through the blood compact, the Philippines consented to be colonized by Spain. However, Spain reneged on the agreement by allowing friars to become hegemonic, as Del Pilar stated, but the time that has passed without strengthening that unity has only fortified the predominance of the monasteries, which have converted the islands into a colony for monastic exploitation. In September 1889, in La Solidaridad, Del Pilar wrote the article titled Asimilación de Filipinas, in which he discussed the blood compact again. He began by arguing against racist ideas that deemed Filipinos inferior. The theory of race, he said, was erroneous. If Spain was not to be racist, it should grant the propagandist movement demand for assimilation. Spain's imperial duty from the Pacto de Sangre was to grant Philippine representation in the Cortes. Del Pilar spoke of the annexation of the Philippines, which was distinct from conquest, assimilation in exchange for annexation. By his use of legal language, Del Pilar suggested the blood compact was a legal treaty. It was time to call Spain to account, he said, lest Spain perjure itself. It was time to curtail friar power. We should note that Del Pilar's narrativization of the blood compact had serious contradictions. If it was a treaty between equals, why was there a need for Spain to assimilate the Philippines? Why not spouse mutual assimilation? 
despite his protests against racism, assimilation was an admission that Filipinos lacked civilization and worship and were racially inferior who needed to be assimilated into Spain. Ironically, Del Pilar could discourse on the Philippines in 1565 only because the islands had in fact been colonized by Spain. Prior to that, we have to admit that no unified polity had existed. The Blood Compact narrative, the Blood Compact narrative conjured the Philippines into existence, arriving on the international stage ready to negotiate a treaty with Spain. The Ilustrada's crystallization of the homeland in the late 19th century was temporarily projected back three centuries earlier, bestowing upon the emergent nation a linear history. No wonder then that the Pacto de Sangre became a foundational event for Ilustrados. It gave the nation a history. Any representation of the country's state in the late 19th century always referred back to the Blood Compact as the genesis of that history. In his annotations of Morga's Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, Rizal presented the Philippines in a golden age with a civilization that was even superior to Europe's in some aspects. Rizal furthered the view in his essay Sobre la Indulencia de los Filipinos, which reiterated the flourishing trade of the Philippines with neighboring countries, the abundance of agricultural and artisanal products, the gold and wealth of the people, and their honorable conduct. Rizal's golden age contradicted Del Pilar's narrative about assimilation and the need to civilize the Philippines. Yet Rizal's annotations made possible the same projection of the nation to the pre-colonial past. Concerning the start of Spanish colonialism, Rizal was self-contradictory, if we look at the notes closely. When Morga stated that, quote, the contracts and negotiations of the natives were consummately illicit, Rizal replied, quote, so are the contracts of all nations and of all peoples, and so too it is, and was the same spirit of the contracts that the first Spaniards celebrated with the Filipino chiefs. In other words, Rizal saw the Pacto de Sangre, de Sangre as illicit, like all other contracts. This view, of course, differed from Del Pilar's and from other illustrados. However, Rizal also asserted that, quote, the conquest cannot be accepted except for some islands and only in a very broad sense. Cebu, Panay, Luzon, Mindoro, etc. cannot be called conquered because, as he said in another note, Spain acquired them by way of pacts, treaties of friendship, and reciprocal alliances. Evidently, when Rizal wanted to refute the Spanish conquest, that is that colonialism started because of a military invasion, he recognized the pacts, treaties of friendship, and reciprocal alliances with the first Spaniards as valid. But when his sites were not trained on the conquest, Rizal saw those same agreements as invalid. Yet at the same time, Rizal also lamented if only Spain had always stood by the latter of those contracts, seemingly aligning his thinking to Del Pilar's. Rizal's annotations concerning slavery, however, offered an interesting and extended note on why Spain succeeded in colonizing the Philippines. He began with this assertion. Thanks to the slaves' social condition and to their number at that time, Spanish domination encountered very little resistance. And the Filipino elites, the Datus, easily lost their independence and liberty. The people, accustomed to the yoke of slavery, would not defend them against the invader, nor would they fight for liberties they had never enjoyed. For them, it was just a change of masters. The nobles, accustomed to tyrannizing by force, had to accept foreign tyranny 
when they found it more powerful than theirs, and that finding either love or lofty sentiments among the enslaved masses, they found themselves without arms and without forces. Although in another note, Rizal stressed that slaves, quote, slaves were not always in such dismal condition, Rizal generalized the tyranny of chiefs whose behavior alienated them from their slaves. In turn, these slaves did not defend their chiefs against the Spanish invaders. The only logical deduction was that Spain acquired the islands through conquest, but conquest was precisely what Rizal tried to disprove, and other illustrators as well could not accept conquest. The notes evince Rizal's confusion and indecisiveness. He said that the Philippines was colonized because of flaws in the pre-colonial social structure. But such flaws would mean that the pre-Hispanic civilization was not as exemplary as Rizal sought to depict it. Ultimately, his incoherence would explain why Rizal did not write a pointed essay on the genesis of Spanish rule. Nevertheless, he strengthened the linear projection of the Philippines to the ancient past, portraying a golden age crucial for the Katipunan's narrative of the blood compact. Written in 1896, Andres Bonifacio's Ang Dapat Mabatid ng Mga Tagalog gave the, com the blood compact a complete emplotment of the past. The manifesto began with a scene of a golden age, like results marked by prosperity, ease, and harmony before the coming of the Spaniards. The entity called Katagalugan traded with neighboring countries, which made them prosperous. As such, all the people lived in an exemplary manner and everyone behaved with honor. People were highly literate in the Tagalog script. The golden age was so crucial in Katipunan historiography that it was one of the questions posed to recruits during initiation rites. They were expected to answer according to the manifesto. The coming of Spaniards was supposedly to offer friendship, which meant a promise to guide the people to progress. But their words were deceptive, and Sikutuna, according to Bonifacio, was seduced by the sweetness of their tempting words. Bonifacio followed Del Pilar's narrative of a single blood oath that, commands, that commenced Spanish colonialism. And he said, this was what was called Pacto de Sangre of King Sicatuna and Legaspi, the representative of the King of Spain. Like Del Pilar's, the manifesto made Sicatuna as the country's embodiment. But Bonifacio portrayed the Spaniards as using their cunning to entrap seduce and deceive Sikatuna. Thus, Sikatuna's consent to Spanish rule could not be valid. The manifesto portrayed the Spaniards much like the serpent in the Garden of Eden and seemingly with no translation problems, as using sweet words which caused Sikatuna to succumb to the temptation. Mesmerized by the serpent and evidently dissatisfied with the golden age, Sikatuna believed Legaspi's promises of enlightenment and prosperity, an act equivalent to the willful eating of the forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which resulted in the fall. With an impaired will, Sikatuna engaged in a blood compact to which the Spaniards cunningly submitted so they could lord it over Katagalugan. And here is a modern rendition of how the Pacto de Sangre would have appeared. With this narrative structure, there was now a plausible explanation for the fall in Philippine history. It was all the fault of Spain, but an awakening was taking place and redemption would come through the Katipunan's uprising. Because the Philippines lost its golden age due to the Pacto de Sangre, Bonifacio wanted to hold Spaniards responsible for both the falsity of the contract and for not abiding by it. 
The manifesto lamented the everyday insults and cruelties suffered by the people. It concluded that the Tagalog must realize the sources of their misfortune and that reason dictated separation from Spain. To signal the genuineness of the Katipunan Brotherhood, the membership ritual involved the neophyte signing their name with his own blood, a new type of blood compact which would alter history. Bonifacio's manifesto completed the emplotment of Philippine history with elements drawn from both Rizal, Del Pilar, and other illustrados, but with an altogether different schema. His manifesto radicalized the Pacto de Sangre to justify revolution. Unlike Del Pilar's version, Bonifacio's narrative enabled the expression of revolutionary ressentiment against all Spaniards, not just against friars. Yet Bonifacio could not accept the fact or could not consider the fact of Sicratuna's gullibility and discontent and preferred instead to emphasize victimhood, a weakness in the narrative akin to Del Pilar's conundrum of assuming equality between the Philippines and Spain, yet desiring assimilation by Spain. Interestingly, all narrative strands demonstrated an aversion to military conquest, favoring the thought that the islanders exercise their agency in their subjugation, regardless of whether their consent was extracted validly or deceitfully. And why was that? Because it gave grounds to hold Spain accountable. Beyond the apparent contradictions, the indelible inheritance from the late 19th century is the linear view of Philippine history, which makes us discourse on the Philippines, quote unquote, in the 1560s and even earlier, without minding the anachronism. We all know there was no Philippines in the 1560s. Like Del Pilar and Bonifacio, we assume the prior existence of the Philippines long before it was formed. We situate the Philippines in a linear trajectory that stretches back to a primordial age. The recourse to anachronism is a window to our inability to admit that the Philippines came into existence precisely because the Spanish conquest happened in the 16th century. Thus, illustrados and revolutionaries alike preferred to imagine their country as entering a covenant with Spain. Today, we perpetuate this myth through the Order of Sicatuna, which President Elpidio Quirino established in 1953 to commemorate, as the executive order stated, first the first treaty, Pacto de Sangre, between the Philippines and a foreign country. In the executive order, the entire history of colonialism was brushed aside. Even the, quote, foreign country with whom the treaty was made, remained anonymous. Its message, the antiquity of the Philippines and its international relations, feeding our proclivity to indulge in the fantasies of an eternal nationhood. Just marvelous. Thank you, Dr. Thank you for all the speakers. Very, very interesting uh, uh, paper spread. Uh, okay, we will now open the floor to questions and comments from our audience. Zoom attendees may use the chat or the Q&A function to send their questions. For our audience on Facebook, you may post your questions in the comment section and the technical team will collate and forward them to our speakers. So do we have questions already, um, Secretariat? Okay. So uh, I have taken a look. Um, 
Uh, okay, there's this question now. Why did Illustrado Historiography utilize ancient history for uh, reinterpreting or reinterpreting history? Were they restricted to ancient history or was it an only option? This is from Neptali John Celes. So any one of the three speakers, may I repeat the question? Why did uh, Illustrado Historiography utilize ancient history for the or uh, interpreting history? Were they restricted to ancient history or was it an only option? Any one of our three speakers? May uh, I may, uh, answer the question? Uh, Malu, okay. Oh, sige. Uh, um, pagbanggit yan. Amy. Uh, dito sa Bob Pelgo, binanggit ko nga yung uh, posisyon ni Rizal tungkol sa kasaysayan. Ang ibig sabihin ni Rizal, uh, yung uh, prehistoria na yon ang pundasyon ng pagubuo ng inang bayan. Kaya paano mong kuhusgahan ng mga Kastila kung hindi mo alam yung yung uh, condition natin sa simula at simula. Ibig sabihin, uh, it is upon this prehistory that the nation is built. Yan ang pinakapundasyon eh. Kung baga sa bahay, eh paano mong maititindig ang isang bahay Kung wala kang pundasyon, kung matiba yung pundasyon ng bahay mo, ibig sabihin, nandun doon yung kultura, yung, yung mga elemento na kailangan sa, sa isang nasyon. Kung matiba yun, you can build this structure na matiba din. Kung wala kang kaalaman doon, e eh, paano maititindig yung uh, gusali? Ganun yung uh, parallelism na nakikita ko. Na, na kay Rizal mismo yun na sinasabi niya na ang pundasyon ng uh, inang bayan ay ititindig doon sa ating kaalaman tungkol sa ating uh, prehistoria. Ibig sabihin yung bago dumating ang mga kasila. Kaya kailangan i-retrieve natin yun. At yon ang ginawa ng mga ilustrado. Halimbawa, pinag-aralan nila yung mga wika tulad ng ginawa ni Pardo de Tabera, yung Sinali ni Rizal yung kay Whites. Nag-retrieve nila yung kay Renhard Brunstetter, kay Alexander von Humboldt. Pinakita nila na merong isang daigdig na ginagalawa ng mga Pilipino. Hindi hindi nagsimula ang kasaysayan sa panahon ng Kastila. Kasi pag ay-nasyon mo na sa kanila nag-isimula yun, o eh anong... <laughs> Uh, ano ang uh, magiging uh, uri ng pagkatao mo? Oh, kaya yung pagkatao, yung identity na tinatawag, national identity, nabubuo yun dahil meron kang pinanggalingan, may, may pinagmulang ka. Parang ano nga eh, uh, building. Kung walang pandasyan na matibay, hindi mo maititindig ang anong mong gusali. Pabagsak yun hanggang... Uh, hindi mo mai uh, hindi ka makakabuo ng anumang gusali kung walang pundasyon na pinagtutuntungan yung gusali na yun. So, yun ang aking sagot. Mm, okay. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, 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 yes, uh, yes, please, uh, June. May I respond to that question? Okay. Para, <clears throat> I think yung mga ilustrados, they were very well read. So alam nila yung kasaysayan ng, ng ibang bansang Asyano and they were very familiar with the history of Europe. Um, pero they had to look back to ancient history of these islands. But why? Because of their search for identity. Ang sabi ni Dr. Veneracion, it is uh, parang kinakailangan yun ang pundasyon ng kasaysayan. But it was also not just for history, it was part of their quest to know who we are as a people. 
Kaya kinakailangan na balikan and find out sino ba tayo. And so they, pinag-aralan nila, they mined the early chronicles. Kaya nga, iyan yung pinaka-objective among these uh, ancient chronicles was morga, kaya yun ang pinili ni Rizal na i-annotate. So it, this was a conscious strategy on the part of illustrados to look back, to search for the beginnings of their history, to find out who they were, and um, to establish a history for the people that they had to began that they began to conceptualize in the late 19th century. Okay, and uh, Ray, do you have any word about uh, yes, the question? Yes, please. I just want to make a, well, just a side comment about the issue of identity, which I think is very important. Um, it's the fact that in the 19th century, Filipinos could just as well identify themselves with the Spanish religious political order. I mean, identifying themselves as Filipinos was, of course, was an almost exclusive uh, characteristic of the illustrative frame of mind, which was profoundly influenced by Enlightenment thinking, which was, you know, a, a big step away from the notion of a world in which God was the supreme creator and father and the Spanish friar was his representative on earth and that Filipinos belong to this kind of, you know, religious political order. And um, I, I don't, uh, I don't think that we should um, immediately assume that the Philippines would have become, the Filipinas would become, have become the Republic of the Philippines. But of course, historical uh, circumstances made it such. And I also, I brought up the fact that the British Empire was always behind the scenes, manipulating the situations. And I actually make the assertion in a recent published article that, that the illustrados, particularly uh, uh, leaders of the mass movement, like Bonifacio and Aguinaldo, were in fact also working for the British Empire. And therefore, uh, the coming of the Americans was a big problem for them for Philippine revolutionists because the American Revolution was also the product of, of a liberal uh, revolution. It was the work of Freemasons in America. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, whether one resists the Americans or, or welcomes them, uh, you know, it, it created a conundrum among uh, the, the, the uh, liberal Filipinos and many revolutionists. And the funny thing is that the continuing resistance to American rule came in the form of religious political movements. And my, my old book ends with the Santa Iglesia of Felipe Salvador uh, in central Luzon as being the last example of resistance to American colonial rule. And yet Felipe Salvador was raised as a devout Catholic and his movement was called Santa Iglesia, the Holy Church which in a way was trying to recapture some of what was lost in the process of the uh, revolution of the late 19th century. In other words, uh, look, searching for a past was all about uh, looking for ways to differentiate the Philippines from what it had been through all those 300 years of Spanish rule. In a way, it was a positive move in, because um, you know, uh, searching for that past and, and and imagining a new a new uh, nation uh, built out of a very different set of uh, foundations actually expanded the scope of the Filipino nation to include the Lumads and the even the Muslims in the south who were now united not by uh, a belonging to a you know a Catholic kind of influence world order but something secular and, and you know which is the modern nation. But my point is, now that we have reached the stage at which, which the, uh, the main patron of, the, of this move towards creating the Philippines as a modern nation state, meaning the United States, uh, is a declining and, and a world power that's about to, you know, um, uh, that has already lost its, its uh, uh, state of primacy in the world order, 
with the Americans gone, we are left with, you know, the possibility of redefining ourselves and taking more stock of the heritage of the Spanish colonial past. I don't know if this makes sense to most people, but it just seems to me that with the end of a world order, the American uh, inspired, the American led world order, with the rise of China as, as an Asian alternative, we need to redefine the place of the Philippines within this Asian uh, world that we belong to because of its unique development for 300 years as a, as a, as a Spanish Catholic uh, religious political entity. Uh, that's all. We need just to, well, in the end, I, I, uh, my, my, my uh, conclusion is that we really haven't given the quincentennial the attention it really deserves. Because it's almost like, oh, well, we have to, because, well, the Americans finders came, we have to do something about it. But I don't think most Filipinos are really aware of the importance of that event. And I think the, 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 the three papers, if you could mind, I think, I hope, uh, really, uh, I think, raised some, some, uh, some issues that, that deserve to be thought about more carefully by, by, by others. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Ray, uh, Jimmy, and uh, June. You know, I think celebrations like this make us look back, but also look forward. So when Ray says that, well, we have to move on, uh, so I think uh, the gaps now in historiography, our location in Southeast Asia should be underscored, no? instead of remaining colonies of Spain and the United States, those were, are going to be looked up to no? we, we, as we look forward. Now, there's a question uh, raised uh, by the same one, the first uh, uh, person who said, why can't the illustrados, uh, because you established that they had to look for the past no? uh, to establish um, an identity. Uh, why did they have to look back so far? Can't they use their present situation to form their identity? Meron, that's a follow-up question. Bakit ba bumalik pa sa napakalayong panahon at hindi ba nila gamitin yung kanilang period, yung context nila to establish their identity? Oh, Jimmy, you are la uh, smiling there. Eh, ang itinatanong niya tungkol sa mga ilustrado eh. Oh. Ang dinidescribe natin kung ano yung thinking ng mga ilustrado. Ngayon, kung ang thinking nito mga millennials na ito ay they can judge their time according to their own time, <laughs> eh hindi na history yan. They are being historical in that sense. Mm -hmm. Because uh, how can you judge something? Eh, kung mga nga nang sinabi mo, you have to look back. <laughs> You know, they have to look forward. Hindi mo pwede yung uh, ma-assess mo alibaw ang development ngayon kung, kung gaano ka layo na naging development natin unless mag step back ka. E gano'n ang pinaproblematize nga ng mga ilustrado. Like alibaw, yung blood compact, bakit ba naging napaka-importanting marker yun? Precisely because uh, nung panahon nga ng revolution, yun ang ginamit nila na justification. O, nangako kayo na kami ay inyong tutulungan, inyong palalakihin. <laughs> Pero ano ginawa ninyo? Pinagsamantala nyo kami, etc. That's the narrative. So pa, paano kang uh, makakamove ng mga tao kung hindi mo babanggitin yung mga ganon? Diba? Parang uh, ano nga eh, kamukha nga ni Rizal, yung kanyang opening mismo, yung sa... Alin nga bang aklat niya yun? Kung pelibusterismo yata yun eh. Di ba? Kailangan buksan mo ang aklat ng iyong nakaraan. <laughs> Upang maunawaan mo ang iyong kasalakuyan. Ganyan yun eh. Uh, otherwise, uh, there should be another panel para itanong yan. Hindi para sa mga historians yan. Because history, eh, we are dealing with historical facts. We live 
through that time, eh, yung mga ilustrado ang gusto nating alamin kung ano yung kamalayan nila. Eh. Para maunawaan din natin yung ating eh, sariling mga kamalayan. Kung gaano karami yung naipasa nilang kamalayan sa atin. Halimbawa, ayun. Maunawaan mo lang yun kung maunawaan mo rin yung mga ilustrado. At yung mga ilustrado, inuunawa rin nila yung mga sinunda nila. That's how uh, consciousness works. Eh, yun ang culture. Eh. Yun, ang, yun ang meaning ng culture. Nagiging culture yan kapag uh, nasalin-salin sa iba't ibang henerasyon. Otherwise, walang national identity ayong kay Rizal. That's the thinking of Rizal that I'm sharing, by the way. So, yun ang sagot ko. Uh, any other uh, thoughts on that uh, from our speakers? Ngayon, may isang parang uh, question coming in why don't why is there no mention of Mindanao Sulu and the ethnic uh, groups uh, from the Ilustrado in their writings palagay ko hindi tama yun eh meron silang mention siyempre pinag-aralan nila yun eh yung Philippine ethnography nga ni uh, Blumentritt they were all praises for that eh? that's the complete ethnography by someone who did not even come here in the Philippines mm -hmm. using uh, prior uh, chronicles mm -hmm. oh, tinuri yan na ah, publish yan sa La Solidaridad at uh, well ang sabi nga ni Ponce yun ang uh, kung aalamin natin yung mga popular halimbawa, kung gaano ka widespread dyan mula sa bundok hanggang sa kapatagan, eh uh, mas maunawa natin ang ating identity. Yun din ang sinabi following the, ano, the uh, prescription or advice of uh, Antonio Marihidor. Kasi sabi ni Rihidor, kailangan alamin mo yung mga iba-ibang lunan yung kabundukan, katapatagan, kabindagat, kasi iba-iba ang mga ano dyan, ang, ang nadidevelop na kultura. At yung variety of cultures na yon, merong advantage yun because it is threatens the race. It threatens the, uh, the nation in the sense na mas maunawaan mo kung bakit gano'n ang kanilang uh, ano, yung kanilang uh, kaugalian, yung mga ritual, kung ba't nagkakaiba-iba, etc. Pero ang pagbanggit, kailangan lang eh, ano, eh, hindi naman yun ang paksa kasi <laughs> maaaring uh, uh, bahagi yun. Ngunit uh, sa kasalukuyan, ang paksa natin kasi yung, yung emplatment nga eh, Mukhang nga nung binanggit ni June Aguilar. Yung emplatment ng Philippine history. At dun sa emplatment na yun, ang mas mahalaga yung kamukha nga niyan, yung, eh, ano, yung pacto di sangre, alimbawa. Yan ang mga markers, hindi ba? Yung prior memorial, para ipakita kung gaano kasama yung mga prior. <laughs> yung gumbursa, hindi ba? Yung mga ganyan. So, okay. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, June? Yes. I think that pwede natin sabihin that the illustrators had a very complicated or complex relationship with, with the Muslims, with the Igorot, and other such groups, uh, cultural communities. But it is too complicated to be discussed, sabi nga ni Dr. Veneracion sa panel na ito. And I've tackled that already in my article on titled Tracing Origins where um, I try to show itong complicated relationship of acknowledging but not acknowledging the, the ethnic minorities. Thank you. Okay, uh, Ray, you have any uh, addition to the comment made? I think that the, uh, the discussion is also limited by the fact that we are supposed to focus on the 19th century illustrators. Yeah. So there, are, there is also the, the thing called the 20th century illustrado, the American era illustrado, and the post-independence era illustrados of which we are all part of, you know. Uh, I think the, in the 19th century, Mindanao and, and Sulu were not part of the Spanish Empire. 
And so, uh, of course, there would not be uh, much mention of Mindanao, Sulu, and, and other ethnic groups because basically they were not conquered by Spain, which, which brings me to the fact that when we discuss the 300 years of, of uh, religious political formation, we are only talking about Pueblo societies, lowland Pueblo societies, and uh, we are noting that the Pueblos did not encompass the whole of the territory of the Philippines, that for every Pueblo there was an anti-Pueblo or whatever was beyond the Pueblo which the Spanish could not know. There are no, there are very little historical records about what was beyond the Pueblo. So does it mean that they don't have a history? Of course they have a history, but all history is written from perspective, from our, from one's perspective, and this perspective of Philippine history, uh, as it was in the late 19th century, uh, arose from where Bonifacio and, and uh, Rizal, all those, uh, all of those who wrote about the Philippines, came from the Hispanized areas. Bonifacio came from Manila, of all places, and Rizal from Calamba. Uh, so. Um, they were, you know, uh, uh, but in the 20th century, it's very different. You know, the American American rule enabled the, you know, the, the Philippines to to, to uh, incorporate areas which were not really part of the Spanish uh, inheritance, so to speak. So it's complicated. Uh, the question uh, is, I think, uh, I think what we have to understand is that the mindset of the 19th century illustrators was quite unique and that we have inherited many aspects of it, but the 20th century, the American century, also created something new, something that all of us in the panel uh, are the children of. Yeah? We're part of the Americanization process, and we, uh, even I speaking English with you, is an effect. I am an effect of this. And the categories of thinking that we have inherited from the, uh, from the, from the Anglo-Saxon civilization that was introduced to the Philippines you know, from 1900 on, and I think, you know, um, created differences between the 20th century and the 19th century illustrators. Okay. Uh, there's a question here which asked, when did the illustrators think, that I think she or he is coming from the assimilation point of view of uh, uh, the illustrados, no? When did they realize that um, the demand for reforms uh, ended? I mean, when was that realization? When did it come to, it dawned on them that the assimilation thrust was, has ended and therefore the more radical uh, position had to be assumed? This is a question from uh, uh, an audience. Rizal became a separatist sometime in 1889. He became disillusioned with assimilation. It wasn't moving anywhere. And all the lobbying they made uh, with the Ministry of the Ultima did not, was not working. And so around 1889, Rizal already began to see that the battleground was not in Spain, it should be in the Philippines, and that um, someday the Philippines should become independent. Uh, and you were... Um... Uh, I think uh, hey. in answering that question, I think we also have to understand that there were many different kinds of illustrados. Rizal was unique. Rizal was an illustrador who migrated from the, from the province to Manila, to, to Madrid, back to the Philippines, to Zamboanga. He, uh, he, he had a very, uh, you know, he, and he was an assimilationist for the most part of his life. But when you think about the other illustrados who returned to their home, hometowns, I'm talking about uh, uh, illustrados who got their education from Manila, someone like Miguel Malvar, Aguinaldo, who went back to their towns and had to deal with the day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day aspects of how to manage towns. So many of them were, uh, as I said, town, town mayors, but they were illustrados because they could read Spanish and they also read about what was going on outside in the world. And then you have Bonifacio, who was uh, much more radical in the sense that he was a committed Freemason and he was anti-clerical and <coughs> Spaniard. So 
uh, when did the question is when did the more radical uh, thrust come in? It depends on where you were. You know, but if you were in Manila, then 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 the our our idea of when it started, the propaganda movement ended. Uh, you know, with the La Liga Filipina, and then the Katipunan, you know, came in and and you know and uh, pushed it to a higher stage. But well, that is what the Katipunanos were thinking. But when you go to the towns outside Manila, they were not thinking the same way necessarily. The Katipunan was a much more limited movement than we think, than I was taught to think. I, I romanticized it too much. And I realized from reading even a book that uh, glorifies the Katipunan like uh, the, the light of liberty, I, I realized that it was not a mainstream movement, hardly ever. And the more we know about what is going on Outside Manila in the big cities, the more uh, the more this this is becomes very obvious. So uh, I, I, my my answer is there are many different kinds of illustrados, there, and and so it all depends on uh, whether you are more like a Rizal, more like a Bonifacio, more like a Aguinaldo. That's why I, I talked about those three types because they represent uh, different kinds of uh, educated Filipinos who who who, who came from different uh, different kinds of scene, uh, scenes, you know, one from the town, from, from one from the Manila in the world, one from Manila. Hi, very interesting, but uh... For the questions, I think the questions were really interesting itself. They were interesting. And uh, I would like to, um, uh, uh, it was a nice panel because it really uh, lends uh, the theme. Uh, and we will have a continuation of this panel uh, next, uh, to, uh, tomorrow. And it will focus on the historiography of uh, Isabella de los Reyes, another illustrado, and um, who uh, I would remember talked about the Ilocanos and the Tingyans. I think he wrote a book on, uh, on them. So at least it, you have here an illustrado who wrote uh, about the ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic group in the Ilocos region, in the Cordillera region, and we also have uh, Rizal. So uh, I would like to um, uh, thank the uh, speakers, the attendees of this panel. And uh, as of now, we are uh, Philippine time. It says here is uh, 11.30. And uh, please return to our uh, room and session tomorrow, which will start also at 9 o'clock. So uh, thank you, Ray, uh, Jimmy, and June for your uh, very interesting. So I think uh, we should, um, as I said, uh, commemorations and celebrations afford us to look back, but also to look forward. So we see a lot of questions that uh, should be studied and be given a um, interpretation. naman sa history. Ito ay mga, lagi tayo nagbibigay ng bago na, na interpretation from historical facts. So it's um, our reading, our generation's reading of the illustrados uh, works and uh, activities. And uh, we discover more questions to be answered uh, for the future. So thank you very much uh, to our speakers, to our attendees. And we hope to see you. Um, ang dami actually dito sa akin mga chat. Papasalamat ng ang mga attendees sa inyong lahat. Very, very enlightening. So different from what they read in the textbooks and uh, in history books. So uh, they are really uh, busog sila. No? Malapit ng tanghalian pero busog sila 
sa bagong kaalaman hinggil sa mga ilustrado uh, at yung historiografiya. Thank you very much, Ray, Jimmy, and June. We'll see. I hope you follow our uh, sessions. No, there are more. Uh, we, this is the first, and I think we will end up to December. So please follow uh, the lectures and the um, different. Um, these lectures are on different aspects of uh, Philippine history and culture. Uh, Spanish uh, culture, particularly influencing uh, Philippine culture. So um, thank you, and I hope to see you. I'm happy to see you, Jimmy, uh, Ray, and June. No, kahit sa ganitong paraan. Okay, marami salamat. And uh, for our Zoom attendees, the Zoom system has automatically tagged you. Uh, your attendance for today. Ito yung akin na, uh, uh, so yung mga Zoom attendees. And uh, think, uh, check your emails for the panel evaluation form that will be sent the next 24 hours. Thank you and have a good day. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye, bye.